Hello and welcome to Hexed Encountered. My name is Joe. In this video, we're going to be taking a gameplay look at the game, The Battle of Kalk and Go. This is actually an upcoming game. The Kickstarter begins October 24th, 2023. And uh, as I'm doing this, it is before that date. So this will be coming up on Kickstarter in the not too distant future. It is from Princeps Games. Um, there is armor in this game, so I can include this as part of my Tanktoberfest for the month of October. And so I'll do that. But um, just kind of going to go through maybe a turn or so of the game, show you how the game works, and hopefully that will help you decide if you want to back it on Kickstarter. If you have played the game Freezing Inferno, the mechanics are very similar. There is some uh, some differences likely due in, in many respects probably to the scale of the game. Uh, Freezing Inferno, of course, was the, uh, the war between Finland and the Soviet Union. The Winter War of 1939-40, uh, and was on a you know a big scale because it covered you know the entirety of basically the uh, Finnish Soviet border. Whereas this one, Kalk and Gull, it's covering a much smaller area uh, on the border between Manchukuo, which is Manchuria, and uh, Mongolia. Basically, it's a much smaller area, so the the air the air rules in particular are very different than they are in Freezing Inferno. Uh, most of the rest of the game is fairly similar. So like I said, if you are familiar with Freezing Inferno, this game will probably be pretty easy for you to pick up. So that's the intro, and let's uh, let's get down into looking at how the game works. Okay, the first thing I wanted to talk about is the setup. So the game comes with two pads. One is obviously a little bit smaller than the other one. But uh, this, this line here, which is on the left on this map, and on the right on this map, is the Kalkan Gold River. And so this is your Soviet setup side. So the Soviet player would place his units on here by marking them down. Same thing for the Japanese player. The Japanese player obviously has a much larger area to play with. So the idea being that these are basically hidden setups and then you reveal them to your opponent and you can start setting up. You can dig in units and so on and so forth. Since I'm going to be playing this solo, I'm probably just going to set up on the map and not actually fill this out because there's not a whole lot of necessity to do that when you're playing by yourself, at least in my opinion. But I do want to point out that if you're playing a two-player game, your Soviet player would fill out his setup over here on this piece, and the Japanese player would fill it out on this piece. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the action sequence here on this card. So at the very top, in initial, uh, uh, initial operations, let's see if we can fix the zoom there, or focus rather. The player's set markers on PPC, that is the political points chart. I'll show you that in a minute. Players take the appropriate number of units. I've already done that. Many maps are filled and place players place units on the board. I kind of talked about that at the beginning. So the next step would be the deck of calendar cards, which I've done and laid out. Uh, you saw a brief glimpse of it here before I put this in the shot. Then we'll set our initial weather conditions and our tactical progress boards will be placed. So to get back to what's going on with the calendar card, so each one of these corresponds to a turn. This is an eight turn game, or eight rounds, I think is what it is what they call it. And each side gets a turn inside each round, right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven and eight. I think I put these two together, hang on a second. And here's eight, there's three in each one. And I kind of piled those two together and they were mixed up. So I shuffled all of these. I'm just going to take the top card off of each one. And that's your event deck for the game. And now this is my calendar deck for the game. So I'm going to put that to the side. And then I'm just going to clean this up. Now our weather chart is right here. So you can see we have fog, wind, rain, clear. Again, if you played Freezing Inferno, some, this will be fairly familiar. Because you do the same thing in that game where you determine the conditions because weather is important. You roll a d12. Now the interesting thing about this game is it comes with four dice and they all have uh, different... Like they're a little unique in terms of how they work. Uh, some of these, like this one, you can see there that says a one and a one on two sides. So you use this and it's got basically like a weighted roll. So it's a very kind of clever way to uh, to kind of determine how odds work. And uh, we'll get into that as we do some gameplay stuff. But we do have to roll a d12. 
we do have a D12 right here. So I'm gonna roll that, it'll be off camera just to keep things simple here. And I rolled a four, as you can see. And a four is clear. So our weather for this turn is clear, which has no effect. Okay, so before we get into gameplay, we have to do our calendar card for the event. So here's my deck. We're going to pull turn one, of course, or round one. And it says, uh, well, let's see. 2-9 July, event three. The first tank corps of Masaomi Yasuoka attacked on the night of July 2nd. Moving in the darkness to avoid the Soviet artillery on the high ground of the river's west bank. Yasuoka detachment lost over half its armor, but still could not break through the Soviet forces on the east bank and reached the Kawatama Bridge. After a Soviet counterattack on 9th July through Yasuoka detachment back, it was dissolved and Yasuoka was relieved of duty. The effect is General's ability does not apply to Japanese artillery. So I didn't even really talk about that, but you have headquarter units that are tied to generals. <clears throat> Excuse me. And each side picks three, and you have to pick one with a value of four, one with a value of three, and one with a value of two. So for the Japanese, we had we picked or I picked Masanobu Tsuji, who is an artillery. So his, he's the one who's not going to have an effect this turn. And as you can see, he's my four. It's right here in the corner, and he's HQ seven, and he's on the map. And I'll show you show you that once we start getting into gameplay. Our number three is Kotoku Sato. He is an infantry general with a value of three. As you can see, he's HQ2. And the, the one, the, the tank, the armor commander, is just a generic commander who has uh, a two, and he's HQ6. On the Soviet side, our four is an armored commander, and he's a recognizable name for most uh, war gamers. Yorgi Konstino, Konstantinovich Zukov, he is uh, four, and he's armor, and he did part. He did actually participate in the uh, the Kalkan goal fighting. So he's our four. Our three is Potapov Mikhail Mikhail Ivanovich. He is an artillery general. He is a three. He's HQ two. Uh, Zukov is a four. In case you didn't notice that, and our infantry commander is generic. He's got. He's the two, and he's HQ nine. So those are our three HQs. Looking back at our uh, sequence of play here, we do the air superiority battle. So this is the biggest departure from the base game. And there is a video done by Princeps Games actually on their YouTube channel that really goes into in depth how all of this works. And it is a, it is a uh, highly recommended read uh, if you are interested in seeing all the options and how everything works and all that stuff. So basically, I'm going to kind of go through it at a, at a kind of high level. And like I said, if you want really granular detail, check out the video from Princeps Games. So here is an air base strength card for the Japanese. And here is one for the Soviets. Let me slide this up a little bit. Right? So you can see strength and capacity so both sides start with a strength of seven which has a capacity of 35. the capacity just means you add the number of bombers and fighters and that air base is essentially like air base size or you know a repaired level of repair however you want to look at it it's how many planes can that air base support at level seven where you start it can host 35 aircraft now this is Japan, both sides start at, at seven. They they're gonna start with 14 fighters and 12 bombers. The Soviets are also going to start at level seven and also going to start with 14 fighters and 12 bombers. And then you have a variable uh, amount of strength here, over here, you can, it's kind of probably hard to see at that level, but you've got rounds one through three, which I've been calling turns, but they're, they're technically rounds. Rounds one through three, rounds four through six, round seven and eight. And so the basically it's four. And you roll a D8 and you have it. So, you know, a one and a two becomes a one, a three and a four becomes a two, a, four, a five and a six becomes a three, and a seven and an eight becomes a four. So if you were in the yellow, this would be two, three, four, five. You roll a one or a two, it becomes the two, et cetera. It's not that complicated. 
seven, eight is three through six. So that's how it works uh, in terms of that. And that's going to give you effectiveness. The Princeps Games YouTube channel has an excellent 20 minute or so description of how all of the various options work. So I'm just gonna kind of go through it really quick, high level and um, you know get it covered so that it's in this, but with a nod towards looking at Princeps Games YouTube channel if you want the full the full explanation from uh, from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Okay, so let's do air superiority battle here, which is our next phase. So I've marked the air strength for both. They start identical, okay? So that makes it real easy. So here's our Soviet card. They've got an air base strength of seven. They've got 14 fighters and 12 bombers. Identically, the Japanese have an air base strength of seven, 14, and 12, okay? So first thing you do, is uh, you roll a die for both sides to determine who has uh, the first player token, which is this guy right here. And we'll talk about what this really means here in a second. So I'm just gonna roll, um, I'll roll the D8 for both here. So this will be the Russians, they get a one and the Japanese get a five. So the Japanese get the first player token. So I'm just gonna stick that there for now. Right, simple enough. Okay, so what does that mean? That means they get to decide if they want to play an extra card. Well, what, what does that mean? All right. So basically, as I showed before, each side has a deck of air battle cards, which have numbers on them, right? Zero through eight. There are eight rounds in the game and there are nine cards. What that means is you play one card per turn and that helps uh, boost your strength, basically, for winning air superiority. So you have to kind of uh, use it in a way it's kind of like a blind bluff like almost like a blind bluff kind of thing like a bid I guess would be a better way to put it so you only have limited resources so your eight obviously is your strongest and your zero is your weakest how you want to play that is up to you and when do you want to play those so each side would choose which card they want to play and you will play one each round and then by the end of the game they're all gone the extra one comes in and that's where this this token comes in that's the first that decides who gets to determine whether they want to play an extra card you can play an extra card once because you have nine cards eight rounds so obviously there's one round where you can play two cards once you play that second card from there on out you can only play one card as first player token they get to decide first if they want to play the card so they they get to decide that after they see which card both sides play initially so let's say the soviets play a five Japanese play a four, right? Kind of middle number for middle number ish on both ends. What this what this will do is we're trying to determine air superiority, and basically the two are are very similar. So because like I said, it's to get your air strength, you get seven plus fourteen is twenty one. So they're in this column here, and the same thing on the Japanese side, seven plus twenty one. So they're also in the same column. So they're identical right now. So what you do is you take this this number that's on the card, right? And you look at the column or the row rather that with that with that card and the number. So they would get an 11 because we're in row 5 column 2021 20, based on the 21 air strength. Similarly for the Japanese, we would go to 4 and go over and they have a 10. So right now it's 11, 10 in favor of the Soviets. So the Soviets have the advantage, but the Japanese have this first player token. They can say, well, you know what? I want to play another card. Let's say the Japanese decide they're going to use this. They're going to play two because they want air superiority in this round. So they, they throw that down. This would go away because it's been, it's been used. So now the Soviets can do, can use their card whenever they want, including right now, or they can hold it and use it later. But the first player token, once someone uses the second card, it's out. No more first player token. What this does is we add this to their number. So the Japanese had a 10, plus 2 is now 12. The Soviets have an 11, so the Japanese now win 12 to 11, and they would have air superiority. So that's how that works. Once these cards are used, they're discarded, they're out. And you uh, basically... We'll go through the rest, and the Japanese now will, will have one card they can play each round. The Soviets will have an, an opportunity, including right now, they could have chosen to say, well, I'm going to play a two as well, and then they would have bumped up as well and been the winner. So now, once you have air superiority, you have multiple options. 
You can attack the enemy's air base. You can attack the enemy's air uh, uh, supply lines, rather. Or you can keep it and use it as a plus one attack modifier in one of the battles. Now, in round one, you cannot attack the supply lines. What the supply line attack will do is cost your opponent political points. So basically, you cost them money. And that, that currency, the political points are the game's currency. And if you've played Freezing Inferno, you're aware of this already. You use that to buy things like reinforcements and do espionage and deception in this game as well, because that costs a certain amount. Right, we have this chart here, and this is the Japanese one, and you can see it costs two political points for espionage or deception, and you start in various places, and once you climb up, you can then use these for um, for actions that will give you a bonus. And it worked the same in, in Freezing Inferno, except the, the, the items you were purchasing were a little different. And uh, if you've watched the Freezing Inferno video, then you would be aware of this already, or if you played that game or whatever. Um, I actually never did a playthrough video of that game, which I really should do, and I probably will. Now that I'm playing this one and kind of re reminded of, of the, the system itself, which I think is a really good and fun system. So anyway, back to the topic at hand, which is the air attack, right? So let's just say it's round one, so we know we can't attack the supply line. So what they want to do then is attack the air base. So the strength of the air base, right, determines how many aircraft the player can have. So since we're at seven on both sides, both sides can have 35. They have 14 bombers and uh, 14 fighters, rather 12 bombers. That's 26. So in theory, they could lose one air strength and it wouldn't impact their forces. But if you were knocked down to 25, you would have to forfeit basically one of your strength points from either side to get down there. They also have any aircraft, which I have not mentioned yet. Each side, as you see, has three. Now I could use tokens, but there's also counters for these. But let's just say for now we're going to do one on the air base and two on the supply lines. Let's just do it that way because it's simpler, right? Because supply lines are, are important because you need that currency to buy reinforcements. If you don't have any p political points to buy reinforcements, your army is going to get whittled away and you're probably going to lose the game. The victory points, I believe, I, I, I don't think I've actually talked about that in this video, but I did talk about it in the first look video. Um, I don't see, I don't think you can see any. Oh yeah, here we have one. This this here is two. That's worth two victory points. There are also some sudden death areas, and I'll talk about that once we get into gameplay a little bit. Basically, if Japan loses uh, Nomanhan, I believe, which is up in the uh, basically northeastern corner of the map, or if the Soviets lose Tomsak Bulak, which is in the southwest corner of the map, which would be over in that direction, and Nomansan's in that direction. Those are the, those are the uh, sudden, death, um, sudden death areas for both sides. So we have one, one any aircraft on both sides. We know the Japanese have air superiority this turn. They have 12 bombers, 14 fighters, same as the Soviets. So basically the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take your D8 and you're going to roll it for the defender. So that would be the Soviets in this case. You roll it for each of the any aircraft guns they have defending their air base, since that's what we're attacking. So they have one, so we roll one die. We get a two, a two is what you want, or a one. You want a one or a two, because that reduces the enemy bombers by that number. Um, well, a one or a two will reduce the enemy, it's a hit, basically, so you reduce by one. So if I had two guns and I rolled twice and I rolled a one and a two, we would reduce them by two. If I rolled anything other than a one or a two, then the attack fails. So now the Japanese are down to 11 bombers. So when you're looking at air strength, when you're talking about an attack on the air base, so that's why I said it's a little complicated because depending on what you do, you have a totally different mechanic. Um, I already mentioned the colors here. That's when you're attacking the supply line. So as I said, a good idea would be to watch the Princeps Games video, which shows all three options, talks about all of this stuff in depth. It's like 20 minutes long, and it'll give you a really good picture of how all this works. I'm just going to do an attack on an air base. So... You take your, your strength plus your anti-aircraft gun, which, is, which in this case is 7 plus 1 is 8. That's the Soviet air strength for this particular mechanic. For the Japanese, you take your bombers. Their air strength is 11. So it's 11 to 8. So that's in favor of the Japanese. So the Japanese will be rolling in the 11 column, and the Soviets will be rolling in the 8 column. 
So each side rolls a die. We'll do the, we'll do the Soviets. They get eight plus eight is 16. That's a really good roll for them. Obviously, eight is the best you can get on an eight-sided die. Japanese have 11. They roll a two, so they get a 13. So they actually lose 16 to 13. It, when that happens, there's no, there's no other result, basically. That's just it. It's done. So they attacked. Nothing really happened. They didn't do, any, do, any, do enough damage to actually reduce the strength of the Soviets. Airbase, if the attacker wins, so if we had flipped that result and it was 16 for Japan and uh, 13 for the Soviets, their strength would go down by one. So that's how that works. Relatively straightforward. Like I said, the, it's not overly complicated, but because you have three different options, it seems like a lot. It seems like it's more complicated than it really is. Um, that's how that works. And now we can move on and get into the Soviet Union's turn, which will actually start the basically the ground combat portion of the game. All right. So one thing I did not mention is the um, there are air strategy cards like this that you can use to kind of modify your result. These are it's kind of an optional rule, but you can use one of these um, each round. Like, for example, this one, this is the Soviet deck, but they're pretty much identical. If your bomber gets hit by the enemy AA fire, you can re-roll the opponent's die for one time. So basically, if you take a loss, like I did as the Japanese there in the previous thing, you can always play this card. If you're a Japanese player, they have one of these as well. That would make you, that would have the Soviet player basically have to do a re-roll. So I did want to mention that because I neglected to beforehand, and that is optional. So you do not have to do that, but you may want to. So now we see here's our basically our main map, right? This is the north uh, eastern corner. So this river right here is the Kalkan Gull River. And yes, I am uh, now standing at the side as opposed to the bottom because the map is pretty big. This is a sizable map. These are head headquarter counters, and this is what you need to have to have your unit be in supply. They also apply. Um, this little two in the bottom there, and I talked about this when I showed the cards. You have one general who equates to an H a HQ, and they have a rating, so two, three, and four. You have one of each. This one's infantry, as you can tell by the little icon in the bottom right corner. That two is the minimum die roll. So if you roll the one, it becomes a two. Obviously, the, the four is better because anything you roll that's lower than a four becomes a four. So that's what that's for. And they have 15 movement points. That's in the lower left corner. The HQ9 is just the identifier, and the 6 in the upper left corner is its defense rating. Similarly, here's an infantry unit, since I had it stacked with that infantry. And you don't have to do that. For a unit to be within supply, they have to be within 6 hexes of their HQ. So the HQs don't have to stay with your combat units, and you probably don't want to keep them with your combat units. I stacked them with them at the beginning. The, the thinking being I'm going to move my units and then, um, you know, uh, leave the HQ behind, so to speak, and maybe they catch up after kind of thing. But here we have an infantry unit with 14 movement points. It's also got a uh, attack rating of two. That's in the upper left. And the defense rating is three. Now, the way this works is you get a stack basically when you start with five units in it. So five infantry here. Basically, they're like steps. That's how I look at it. You have a five-step unit there. That's one unit, five steps. The way it works is you take the initial number, which is two for an attack, and then you add the additional steps. So that would be four. So you have a six-strength unit here, and then each time they lose one, that's going to go down by two. Same, same thing with defense. So this, this one will attack at a six, and it will defend at a seven. Tanks are similar, right? You have a four attack plus four additional eight. They attack at eight. They defend also at eight. Uh, artillery, they only defend at one plus four would be five when they're full strength, and they but they attack at eight. So you get the idea. It's very, very simple and straightforward. And now your movement points are pretty easy as well. We do have a terrain effects chart where you move your unit using the terrain cost of the hex you're moving into. Really standard hexed encountered stuff. Nothing, nothing outrageous, nothing overly complicated or that's going to, you know, confuse anybody. This track along the corner here, this is your PP, your political points uh, chart, PPC, I guess. And you can't see it because it's further down, but the Japanese start with 25 and the Soviets start with 26. And again, you use that, you'll get uh, 
currency, which um, this being a pre-production model, there was no currency with it. I do have the Freezing Inferno game, which has currency as well, so I could use that. But I wasn't probably going to get into the whole political points thing, aside from explaining what you do with it. Um, because it's, rel it's relatively straightforward, it's not anything overly complicated. But I wanted to kind of look at how the combat works and everything, because it is a war game. The right. Soviets go first. Now these are the Soviet units. They've got the red star in the corner, easy to identify. The Japanese units are white and they have a rising sun in the corner. Really easy to identify. So the, so the Soviets would go first. So again, thinking about this from a, you know, a strategy standpoint, Soviets are in a compressed area as, comp as compared to the Japanese. Now historically, the, the Soviets actually won this battle. Um, and it's really the Soviets and the Mongolians against the Japanese and the Manchukuans. So they, there is cavalry. Some of the commanders on the Soviet side, I think there's at least one who's a Mongolian commander, which is, which is a, you know, the, the, there's nice historical nods within this game, which I always enjoy as well. So talking about moving your units. So let's just, let's just ignore the, the HQ for the moment. They have 14 movement points. We're on a road, We're on a road. So as you can see, here's the road. It costs two movement points, right? And then you have a list of all your abbreviations. So, oh, PPC, political points chart. I was wondering about that earlier. Uh, you'll see these, these counters too, the N-O-N-T, the NONT counters, no offense next turn. Um, some of our combat results will, will include that. And then you have your unit characteristics here, just to make it clear that the attack value for infantry is a two, their defense is a three, their range is 14 movement points, etc. cetera. Uh, terrain attack modifiers, high grass, etc. cetera, right? Uh, key checkpoints, river ford. So there's a river ford here. You also have bridge markers, which also were not included in this pre-production model. They did send us kind of a, like a PDF of what the bridge counter looks like. So you could, you know, kind of build your own. I'm not a particularly crafty person. <laughs> so I don't usually do the print and play stuff. If I buy a print and play game, I'll usually mock it up for tabletop simulator and use it that way. But anyway, that's a digression. That's not important at the moment. So we know that the movement points for road is two. So they can go, this stack can go one, two, they can go seven, as long as they stay on the road. One, two, three. Then they got to cross the Ford. And the Ford is an additional two. So really they can move six. So they can go one, two, three. Then this is going to cost them basically, well, let's say two, four, six. Two more is eight, 10, 12, 14. So they, let's say they move here, right? So they move there, they're done. Now the HQ that was with them has 15 movement points. So they could move up and be adjacent to them. But we're just going to... Uh, basically stay here, I think. Now the armor, if we wanted to move the armor, they actually have more movement points. I'm trying, yeah, this is grass. So this, this is grass, this is clear. So let's say the tanks will go two, four, six, eight, 12, 14, and then clear costs three. So they could go here for 17 and stop, right? Now, if we wanted to move our artillery or anything else, we can move all of the, all these forces up. We can take these guys here and say, okay, they're going to move as well. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and they have to stop there because they can't cross the ford. And then the artillery similarly can go two, four, six, eight, ten, and stop because they can't go any further than that. They only have eleven movement points. I'm not going to go through the whole turn because it, it, it'll make the game real. It'll make the video rather really long. What I'm going to do instead is show you how combat will work. Okay, so let's say that the, this, this is the Soviet disposition. And we have some, uh, some Japanese infantry here. And let's say they moved up and we're here. And their HQ is within six, is within six hexes and they bring some tanks up and the tanks are here. All right, so now how do we do combat? Unlike some games where you might be able to take, take these two and attack the same hex, that's not how this one works. It's always one-to-one. -one. So if we said that this guy was going to attack here, now it would, again, you've got a two plus four more is a six, attacking a two, a three plus four more is a seven. So it's six to seven. 
Now you have your combat uh, results table, which is here. And it handily gives you this six to seven right here. So, and then you do your die roll. So that part of it is really straightforward again. So you can see you have uh, basically an 81% to 99% of uh, attack to defender strength. And then of course, as you go higher, you're gonna see the results get worse for the defender. Like a DE would be the defender is eliminated. This is number of losses. Uh, and then before the slash is attacker losses. So at this, if we roll anything, if we roll a, well, you have terrain effects too, so you could go negative. Yes, the first defend, defender like retreat, you need to roll a four. You need to roll a four. And that's a, again, an adjusted number. So that's your combat results table. So some of the other things on here while I'm looking at it. You see the CA, that's counterattack. Defender retreat is DR. The NONT, we already talked about what NONT means. So you can see counterattack, defender retreat, no offense next turn. Basically, you, I guess that's similar to like being disrupted. They can't do any kind of offensive activities in the following turn. Uh, the, that DR would be a, def, a defender retreat. So the DR there will go with a step loss usually. So they can actually stay in the hex if they want. So they have the option of retreating. So you might want to retreat if you're afraid that you're going to get hit again and, and get destroyed. So like if the Soviets here were attacking, say, this, this unit, let's say this tank unit's attacking this infantry, and they do they get that result uh, of a one-step loss and a, and a you know, potential retreat, Knowing that this guy can now attack them again and they're already reduced by one, they might elect to retreat back to here, which would prevent them from attacking kind of thing. So that's that's the thinking with that. I mentioned earlier the dice. So you have standard a standard D8 that that I've that you've already seen, where basically all your numbers are even, right? It's it's your standard die, standard eight-sided die, 12.5% of each result. 12.5% chance rather of each result. Then you have some custom D20s or a custom D20 that has the numbers one to eight. So on that one, you have a 10% chance of a one or a two or a seven or an eight, but you get a 15% chance of three, four, five, or six. So um, that one is an interesting one because it's a weighted die, which is, you know, it's not anything that hasn't been done before, but I think it's a cool mechanic to include something like that because it gives you more flexibility. And then you have a another custom D20 that has the same numbers one to eight, but you get a 5% chance for a one or an eight, 10% for two or seven, 15% for three or six, and 20% for four or five. So you get to pick kind of which one you want. So this, this way, the ratio of the strength of the units can have more impact on the result of the battle because the players will have less chance to totally fail with a really bad roll or to perform really, really well with a good role. So I kind of like that. I think that's a that's a neat twist and it's nice to have the option of choosing which one you want to use. Then we, again, we have our general skills and they come into effect if they are within range. So this guy here, right, he's one, two, three, four, five, six away from both of these units. So he's in range. On this side, we got one here, one, two, three, four, five, six. He's also in range. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, they're both in range. So he would give the minus, the, the two thing being the lowest possible roll for infantry on that side and the two roll being the best or lowest possible result on the armor side for Japan. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a look here. So we have our dice. So here's our D20. It's got uh, two sevens, two eights. It's got actually yeah, two sevens. And this one has two sevens as well, two twos, only one one. So this is the one that has the lowest possibility of a one or an eight. So let's use this one. So we'll use this one, we roll it, we get a three, right? So with a three on our combat table, in our 81 to 99% roll, a three is a CA which means a counterattack. So the defender would then have the option to do a counterattack. So let's let's do a counterattack, right? So now the, the Soviets are gonna counterattack back. So this infantry is going to attack that. The odds are the same. So 
So we roll and we get a four that time. And again, if we look in this column and a four is going to be, uh, oh wait, that actually was not a counterattack. That was no effect. So a two would have been a counterattack. And I forgot to look at the terrain. So they're in, they're both in clear actually, Butterfingers. Uh, so in clear, you don't actually get any um, modifiers for terrain. We don't need to worry about that. But the four, to get back to this, the four would be a defender retreat. So these guys would have to then retreat like so. And that's really all there is to, to combat. It's very straightforward, like I said. Um, so let's talk a little bit about like political points and so on and so forth. I mentioned the general skills, right? So in this case, it was a two. Let's say that had been a four. When I rolled the three, it would have automatically become a four. So that's the benefit of that. Then, um, oh, we also had our event card where the, gen the Japanese artillery general is basically, his impact is negated for this turn. Um, reinforcements. So... Again, you have PPC, which or PPs rather, political points, which are currency. And you spend those to buy units and do things like the espionage and deception track. You can purchase those. So when you buy a reinforcement, each reinforcement step costs five for infantry, six for cavalry, seven for artillery, eight for tanks, and then you can also buy bombers and fighters. Fighters cost seven, bombers cost eight, and HQs cost 10. So as I said, the J Japanese start with uh, 25, the Soviets start with 26, and it's based on the number of victory hexes you own. So each victory hex has a number. You can see here, Fui Heights has a victory value of two. It's currently owned by the Japanese, so the Japanese will get those two points. At the very start of the game, if you add up what's in the Soviet side and with red flags like this one right here, this one is worth six. That's a that's a very valuable one. The Soviet ones are more valuable. This is the area that was, um, well, basically this is to kind of balance the gameplay, I think. So the, the ones on this side are more valuable. So if the, if the Japanese manage to come across the river and get and start capturing these Soviet points, the Soviets' political points are going to drop dramatically. Conversely, on the Japanese side, if you know if they push through here, if these guys push through and they capture this, it's only worth two. But that is two you pull from Japan and you give to the Soviets. And so when the next batch of cash essentially is handed out, the Soviets will get more and the Japanese will get less. That's why you attack supply lines as well, because that will also remove currency from the other side. And you can only do that starting in round two. So the game flows pretty quickly. You know, let's uh, before I get into into my final thoughts, you do have weather conditions that I rolled for at the beginning. We had clear, but if you had say fog, that reduces your ground units movement by one point, and the air units don't play, so there is no air superiority that round with fog. Wind, your bomber's accuracy is reduced, so you you take one a minus one modifier on your strength. Rain, clear terrain, and wet, wetland hexes cost one movement point additional. So your base, your base for that clear is three, so that would become four, and wetlands is three also, so that would also become four. And clear weather has no effect. Then you have tactical improvements, which is the espionage and deception. So that's this guy right here. Okay, so the way this works is when, when you're attacked, the defending player can use a deception marker and withdraw the unit before the battle. So... To get that, you have to actually get, it tells you right here, the player can re-roll their 08 deception. When attacked, the defending player can withdraw the unit before the battle. It costs two political points. After usage, the process can be restarted. So once you get to three, it's available. Once you use it, you call, it costs you two PP. Um, actually, no. Once you use it, it starts back at the start box and you have to pay it up. So you pay two PP to go to one, two more to go to two, two more to go to three, etc. up the ladder. Same thing with espionage. It costs two. After usage, it gets restarted. What that lets you do is you can re-roll your own or your opponent's die if you're not satisfied with the result. So it's a re-roll. So they're valuable. 
Um, and again, part of the, the charm of this game is determining what you want to do um, with this, with this, with these extra mechanics. Like, how do you want to use your air superiority, assuming you can get it? How do you want to use these tactical improvements, or do you just want to use all your points and buy buy units and just concentrate on the ground war? You have options, and I think there's replayability in there because you can actually choose and pick and choose which way you want to go. Like maybe I'll play as Japan once, and I'll just say, I'm you know what, I'm not even going to worry about air superiority. I'll go through it if I get it. Maybe I'll take the plus one on my attacks because what I really want to do is push across the river and knock the Soviet units out and capture stuff and win the game that way. You know, because if they can get down, it's not on in it's not in shot right now, but down south of here is the jet the Soviets uh instant the victory hex that if the Japanese catch it capture it and hold it for till the end of the turn or the end of the round rather, they win the game. And the, the Nomen Han is the one on the Japanese side, which is over that way. I think this is a really cool system. Let's put it that way. It's very easy to do. Some people might say it's a little overly simple with the way the units are rated. I don't know that I would necessarily agree with that. It's interesting, and I love the fact that it's doing this particular battle because this is a, you know, obviously this is a battle that wasn't or isn't really popular as a topic for games. Not that there aren't games on it. Of course there are. But it's no Bulge or, or Stalingrad or something like that where there are, you know, so many games that you can't even count them all. Yeah, I mean, Freezing Inferno, same kind of thing. Like, the Winter War gets uh, gets more attention than this battle does, but it's not exactly an overly, overly gamed topic either. But back on this game, my final thoughts is I would definitely recommend this game. I think it's a fun game. It's not, it's not a simulation. So don't go into the game expecting it to, you know, be really hardcore. It's not that. The hardest thing to get your mind wrapped around will be the air, the air stuff. But once you do it a few times, I think you'll get it um, because it's really not that bad. You do, you almost have to look at it as kind of two or well, it's really mostly the confusion. I think mostly comes in when you're talking about the the various mechanics that deal with the uh, air superior, not the air superiority. Well, that's that too, maybe, but especially like the supply line attack and then the air base attack. Taking, taken separately, each of those elements is not all that complicated, but when you pile them on top of each other, then you're like, oh, I get a little bit confused, maybe, at least initially. Like I said, watch that video on YouTube from uh, Princeps Games, and the, um, you, know, you can get a really good grasp of how each of those work. So that's going to do it. I'm going to wrap it up here. That's uh, that's my thoughts on this game. I do recommend it. Check out the Kickstarter if you're watching this before October 24th, 2023, or during the, the campaign, so shortly thereafter, um, and you think this game might be interesting for you, or you know you just want to give it a shot, uh, support, a, support a, a gaming company like Princeps Games. They've done uh, several games now. They're all good. So... You know, if you have if you have interest, definitely back this game, I would say. So I will post a link for the game's Kickstarter campaign in the description. So check that out. You know, Freezing Inferno is an excellent game as well. And it's a different scale, but the mechanics are very similar. Uh, it also has a, a more streamlined air game. But other than that, it's very similar to this one. So uh, I think that system or the system that really is in both of these games is a really good system. And like I said, I recommend it. So I'm not going to babble about that anymore. That's going to do it. My name's Joe. This has been Hexed Encountered. If you have any questions, comments, etc., please feel free to post them. As always, they are appreciated. But uh, yeah, until next time, I do want to uh, just say, like I always do, happy gaming.